Hi, everyone. Um, I am Leanne Quinn, the program assistant for the Chemical Weapons Convention Coalition at the Arms Control Association. Thank you all for attending our webinar today on 10 years of chemical weapons use in Syria, a look back and a look ahead. During today's webinar, our speakers will assess the progress that has been achieved to eliminate Syria's chemical arsenal, what is left to be done, and how to ensure chemical weapons are never used again. I'd like to take a moment before we start to thank not only our speakers, but also Global Affairs of Canada, Weapons Threat Reduction Program, and the Arms Control Association for their continued support. So our program will start off with opening remarks from the Director General of the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, or the OPCW, Ambassador Fernando Arias. Following Arias's remarks, Dr. Paul Walker will moderate our panel, which will feature three excellent speakers, including journalist Joby Warwick with the Washington Post and author of the book Redline, former OPCW Director General Ahmed Azumju, and UN High Representative for Disarmament Affairs, Izumi Nakamitsu. Due to a UN obligation, Izumi Nakamitsu will not be joining us live for today's events, but she has prepared video remarks that we will present during this webinar. This discussion is being recorded and will be published on the CWC Coalition website within a day or two. And with all of that out of the way, I am very, very pleased to introduce our first speaker, Ambassador Fernando Arias. Arias is currently serving his second term as the Director General at the OPCW. Mr. Director General, we are all very honored to have you with us today to address this very important topic, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ms. Quinn. Uh, dear co-organizers of this special event, Mr. Paul Walker, Mr. Dale Kimla, dear Ambassador, dear friend, Ahmed Uzunzu, and uh, dear Mr. Joby Warwick, ladies and gentlemen, it gives, me, it gives me a great pleasure to open today this event co-organized by the Arms Control Association and the Chemical Weapons Convention Coalition. I wish to express my appreciation of the Chemical Weapons Convention Coalition and the civil society community in general for their ongoing engagement with the OPCW. Civil society has long been a key partner of the organization. Its support is crucial to achieving our mission of a world free of chemical weapons. This April will um, will mark a milestone in that uh, in understanding when we commemorate the 25th anniversary of the entry into force of the Chemical Weapons Convention. This uh, precedes another landmark a year in 2023 when we will celebrate the 30th anniversary of the signing of the convention in Paris in 1993. The global security landscape, however, has evolved greatly since, 90, since, the, since the 1990s, when the convention was signed and entered into force. We continue to face a traditional and also new threats, including the re-emergence of the use of chemical weapons. Over the course of the past decade, we have all witnessed repeated violations of the global norm against chemical weapons in Iraq, in Malaysia, in the United Kingdom, in the Russian Federation, and in the Syrian Arab Republic. Chemical weapons have been used more than once during the civil war in the Syrian Arab Republic, despite the significant work and financial resources of public money of the member states of the OPCW invested in eliminating its chemical weapons program. In response, the states parties through the OPCW policy making organs continue to take action to ensure the full implementation of Syria's obligations. The Secretariat continues to work to implement the mandates it has received from the Convention and the OPCW policy-making organs, the Executive Council and the Conference of the State's Parties. Let's uh, have a look at the background, the background of the OPCW's involvement in Syria. 2022 will be the ninth year 
of the organization's engagement on the Syrian chemical weapons dossier. It is a disturbing reality that this uh, matter remains far from closed. The organization's involvement commenced with its uh, deployment in 2013 under the United Nations Secretary General's mechanism for investigation of alleged use of chemical weapons and biological weapons in Syria. On the 21st of August that year, the global community was astounded as Sarin, a nerve agent, was used in the neighborhood of Ghouta in Damascus. Many civilians were killed and many others injured. This abhorrent incident triggered diplomatic efforts for the destruction of a Syria's chemical weapons program under a transparent international framework. On the 14th of September 2013, under the auspices of the Russian Federation and the United States of America, Syria acceded to the Chemical Weapons Convention. Shortly after, the Executive Council of the OPCW adopted a decision to destroy all chemical weapons declared by Syria under a stringent verification. This was subsequently reinforced by the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2118, the same year, 2013. The mission that followed was unprecedented for the organization. Never in its history had the OPCW implemented an accelerated destruction operation amidst an active conflict. With the support of 30 states parties and the European Union, the OPCW and the United Nations oversaw the removal of 1,300 metric tons of chemical warfare agents within a year for destruction outside Syrian territory. Our activities related to Syria's chemical weapons should have ended there. But unfortunately, they have continued. Since then, three instruments have been used by the OPCW to implement the organization's mandates. The Declaration Assessment Team, the Fact and Admission, and the Investigation and Identification Team. In addition to those instruments that we will analyze later, Following reports of the facts and admission and decisions by the OPCW Executive, uh, the Executive Council condemning chemical weapons used in Syria, the Security Council in 2015 created the OPCW United Nations Joint Investigative, Investigative Mechanism, known also as the GIM, to identify those responsible of use of chemical weapons in Syria. The GIM attributed in four cases the responsibility of use of chemical weapons to the Syrian Arab Republic, and in two cases to uh, the ISIL terrorist group. The GIM's mandate, however, was not renewed by the Security Council in November 2017, and the GIM could not finish its task. Let's uh, comment on uh, the Declaration Assessment Team. The Declaration Assessment Team is an expert team uh, that uh, was formed uh, because of those reasons. After Syria acceded to the convention in September 2013, it provided an initial declaration of its chemical weapons stockpiles, including chemical agents, chemical weapons production and storage facilities, and means of delivery. Subsequent verification of this declaration, however, resulted in the identification of numerous gaps, inconsistencies, and ambiguities, which meant that the declaration was not acceptable. State parties to the convention expressed their concerns about the accuracy and completeness 
of Syria's declaration. As a result, the Secretariat put in place the declaration assessment team in April 2014. The mandate of this team, which con that continues to work, is to ensure that Syria declares all the components of its chemical weapon program through a thorough assessment of information shared by Syria and otherwise collected by the declaration assessment team. <clears throat> to date, 24 rounds of consultations have been held between the declaration assessment team and Syria, the last occurring in February 2021. Despite of eight years of consultations, the information made available has not been sufficient for the Secretariat to confirm that Syria has submitted a declaration related to its chemical weapons program that can be considered accurate and complete. There are still 20 outstanding issues that remain unresolved regarding that declaration. At present, the Secretariat's activities in Syria have been impacted by delays in responses to our correspondence regarding planned deployments and in the issuance of visas for members of the declaration assessment team. Accordingly, the 25th round of consultations of the DAT, declaration assessment team, has been delayed since April last year. Syria's cooperation with the OPCW and assistance to the Secretariat is not a matter of choice. It is a legal obligation under Article 7 of the Convention. Moreover, Security Council Resolution 2018 of 2013 here, and the correspondent Executive Council decisions require Syria to, I quote, accept and provide immediate and unfettered access, end quote, to the Secretariat's personnel. Based on these mandate, mandates, it is the Secretary's responsibility to request information, and Syria's obligation is to provide it. A few words about the fact-finding mission. This is another team that is in charge of investigating chemical weapons use in Syria. The OPCW created this team in 2014 to establish the facts surrounded allegations of chemical weapons use in Syria. The fact and the mission's work is ongoing, and to date, it has investigated 80 allegations of chemical weapons use and issued 19 reports and two interim reports. It has further determined 20 cases of likely or confirmed use of chemical weapons in Syria. Only last month, the fact and the mission issued two new reports. The first involved two incidents in, the, in an area of the, in the Syrian territory called Marea in September 2015. Information analyzed by the fact and the mission provided reasonable grounds to believe that the vesicant a mustard agent had been used in the first incident. The data analyzed related to the second incident did not allow the facts and the mission to establish if chemicals had been used as a weapon due to insufficient evidence. The second report concerned uh, an incident in the area of Kafra Zeta in October. 2017. The information analyzed by the fact finder mission provided reasonable grounds to believe that the chlorine cylinder was used as a weapon in this place. The investigation and identification team, a team that we will comment on later, of the OPCW in charge of identifying the perpetrators of use 
is at present reviewing these reports. A few words about the IAT, Investigation and Identification Team. In June 2018, the Conference of the States Parties of the organization decided that the Secretariat shall put in place arrangements to identify perpetrators of chemical weapons use in Syria. This led to the creation of the so-called Identification Investigation Team, IIT, the same year to carry out this mandate. Since its establishment, the IIT has released two reports. The first in April 2020, related to three cases, and the second in April 2021, related to one case. The first report concluded that there are reasonable grounds to believe that the Syrian Arab Air Force used chemical weapons in Latamena on three occasions in March 2017. Sarin twice and the chlorine once. The second report concluded that uh, there are reasonable grounds to believe the Tiger forces of the Syrian Arab Air Force used chlorine in Sarakib in February 2018. These investigations have been challenging. The obstacles faced by the IIT include Syria declining access to its territory for its members, as well as access to any confidential information concerning the Syrian chemical dossier. Nonetheless, the IIT continues its work and will issue new reports in due course. The current situation regarding the chemical weapons dossier is uh, in a few words, the following one. Notwithstanding the challenges, the policy making organs have resolutely demanded that Syria redresses its failure to declare and destroy all its chemical weapons and chemical weapons related facilities. Following the assurance of the first IIT report, the Executive Council of the organization in July 2020, requested Syria to declare within 90 days the chemical weapons it used in Latamena and all those it currently possesses. In addition, the Council also requested Syria to resolve all the 20 outstanding issues regarding its initial declaration of its chemical weapons stockpile and programs. Pursuant to that decision, I reported to the Executive Council and to all states parties in October 2020 that Syria had not completed any of these measures. Subsequently, in April 2021, the Conference of uh, the States Parties decided to suspend certain rights and privileges of Syria which are namely three groups, to vote in the conference and the council, to stand for election to the council, and to hold any office of the conference, the council, or any subsidiary organ. The conference decided that these rights and privileges will be reinstated once I have reported that Syria has completed the requested measures adopted in July 2020 Executive Council decision. In closing, looking ahead, today at the global scale, with 99% of declared chemical weapons stockpiles destroyed, the OPCW is close to realizing the disarmament goal of the convention. However, what we have witnessed in Syria and elsewhere, confront us with the reality that the threat of chemical weapons persists. 10 years of chemical weapons use in Syria 
has tested the international norm against the use of chemical weapons. But the norm remains strong. When states parties such as Syria are identified as uh, having used chemical weapons, the OPCW policymaking organs take action. And for its part, the Secretariat implements their mandates. In doing so, we are mindful of the need to adapt to tackle traditional and also new threats and to keep pace with process in with progress in science and technology. Our new Center for Chemistry and Technology currently under construction and uh, scheduled to become operational in 2023 will be a key tool in this regard. The Chemtech Center, as we used to call it, will be a repository of knowledge and skills pertaining to chemical disarmament, non-proliferation, chemical security and safety, and peaceful uses of chemistry. It will bolster our capacity to face the 21st century chemical weapons threats. Impunity for those who employ this abhorrent and cruel armament cannot be accepted and perpetrators must be held accountable. The security resolutions 2118, 2209 and 2235 of the years 2013, 2015 and 2015 respectively contain this strong message. The international community must be steadfastly must steadfastly maintain this zero stance. We owe we owe it to the victims as well as to future generations. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary General, uh, Director General. Uh, really excellent introduction, I think, to our discussion today. So with that, let me introduce Joby Warwick, our first speaker. Uh, Joby is a, is a journalist and um, reporter with the Washington Post, I think, as most of you know. Been with the Post for about 25 years now and just recently uh, published a book called uh, Red Line, which I happen, by the way, to have here and am in the midst of reading right now. Good advertisement for you. Joby, the stage is yours, Joby. Thank you. I appreciate a chance to join such a distinguished uh, panel, including three leaders whose work I've followed very closely as part of my own journalism uh, as they've led their organizations through some extremely challenging times. Uh, my job is to condense 10 years of uh, highly complex history into about 10 minutes, and that's, of course, impossible. But uh, DG Arias did a great job, I think, of sort of setting the stage for this. I know many of you are familiar with the issues already. And and, uh, and my business, of course, is uh, and journalism is kind of reductive history. So we're going to try to, to make this very quick. And I apologize in advance for the, the, the many omissions in this short overview. Um, I am going to show some slides in a second. But at the outset, I think it's important to acknowledge the ongoing Syrian conflict, which continues to be one of the most important unresolved issues of our time. And as uh, DG Arias just uh, said, the chemical file remains very much unresolved with key facts to be determined and questions of accountability to be addressed. And we should also be mindful, of course, of the hardships and suffering of the Syrian people, including the victims of chemical attacks. And I decided to write the book because as a journalist who covered weapons proliferation and arms control for years, I was astonished by the extraordinary, uh, indeed historic nature of the events that we watched unfold in 2013 and 14, and also by the, the fleeting attention paid to them by the public at large. And among the, the punditry here in Washington, the conventional wisdom quickly jailed around the notion that the disarmament effort was, was mostly a failure. In, in the US, it became entangled in a partisan debate over President Obama's use of the words red line. And then in 2014, we saw the witness of uh, with start of the chlorine attacks uh, and suggesting to people that uh, maybe Syria had not given up its chemicals at all. 
And of course, lay people uh, don't really appreciate the difference between chlorine and, and sarin and VX. And of course, the war dragged on and every day the brutality of the war kind of raised the question, what difference does it make? Whether these atrocities are, are committed with chemical weapons or, or just barrel bombs. Now, these questions, which are good ones, obscured the fact that something quite remarkable had taken place in Syria, as, as Director General just described, 1,300 tons of chemical weapons were destroyed along with infrastructure, mixing equipment, munitions, production facilities in less than a year during a civil war. And as a feat of arms control, this has never happened before. And so clearly the disarmament was incomplete, accountabilities were not resolved, but how this played out in such a brief period of time and under such difficult circumstances was a story worth telling. And so my book is a nonfiction narrative that tries to put readers on the ground with some of the key personalities, and sadly, just some of them, through their successes as well as their disappointments. Now, today, I'm going to highlight just four aspects of the mission, their storylines from a journalism point of view, that are unique and worth highlighting. And here they are in rough order of, of how they happened. <clears throat> so standing up the deal how the diplomatic agreement became a tangible plan. And of course, uh, we, we know a bit about that. Boots on the ground, what it was like uh, the race inside Syria to remove the weapons and destroy infrastructure. The demil on the high seas, which is destroying the weapons and precursors outside Syria, which was quite an adventure in itself. And then assessing blame, which, which uh, as the director general said, is, is still to be uh, determined or still to be continued. Now, the standing up of the deal, uh, I'm not going to take the time to go to the history and all the controversies over how the Syrian agreement came to be, but some important background that, that bears noting. We know that in 2012, Syria possessed a chemical weapons program that was quite large, very sophisticated, and highly dispersed in fortified bunkers around the country. Syria's program was well understood in the West after years of successful penetration by intelligence agencies, which I describe in my book. It was well known, for example, that Syria had vintage agents such as sulfur mustard, as well as hundreds of tons of high quality sarin and VX precursor, the former stored in bulk form to be mixed just prior to use. Um, so anyway, just, just again, this was just describing uh, what, the, what this stockpile was like. And lastly, the point that there was a unique formula uh, for, for sarin, which was understood and well known and which becomes important uh, as the story progresses. Um, and as we just heard, and as we all remember, uh, there was a series of chemical attacks that take place from late 2012 into mid-2013, some of which were assessed to involve sarin. And the, the game changer, the historic attack that took place on August 21st, 2013, involved rockets containing sarin that fell on several opposition-held neighborhoods in the suburbs of Damascus. Sarin gas seeped into basement bomb shelters, creating massive numbers of casualties, the numbers are, have always been in dispute, but the U.S. estimate was around 1,400 people killed. Uh, my book describes the attacks to the eyes of witnesses, and it also recounts the bravery of a small team of UN and OPCW in investigators led by Arke Selström, the Swedish uh, scientist who happened to be on the ground at the time. And the investigators insisted on traveling to, this, to, to Ghouta to collect evidence Despite coming under sniper fire and being held at gunpoint, they refused to turn back, insisting on finishing the job they'd come to Syria to do. And as this drama is playing out in Syria, some extraordinary diplomacy is underway involving Washington and Moscow. The potential breakthrough that is announced in Geneva on September 14 takes nearly everyone by surprise and generates a good bit of skepticism. The agreed framework calls for a unilateral disarmament in Syria in just nine months, but other than the timeline, the agreement is quite vague because no one has worked through the logistics of how such a feat could happen. And yet once the basic agreement is set, the details come together with lightning speed by the, by the usual standards of diplomacy. The legal underpinnings for the deal, including Syria's accession to the CWC, were crafted in just two weeks and approved in near simultaneous votes by the UN Security Council and the OPCW on September 27, 2013. It was a feat that required an extraordinary level of cooperation and coordination, including between the US and Russia. 
And because no single organization existed with both the expertise and the resources to oversee the, the implementation, a brand new entity had to be created, which we knew as the joint mission made up of OPCW and UN personnel and a leadership that directly reported directly to the UN Secretary General. By October 1st, just days after this, so the, the, the final language was drafted, the joint mission and advanced team was already on the ground in Syria and ready to go. We're just getting a sense then of the challenge and how daunting it will be. The team gets off to a roaring start and in 30 days they've completed an initial inventory that included visits to more than 20 chemical weapon sites, some of them so close to the front lines that the team could hear artillery rounds whistling overhead as they traveled. There were, there were constant reminders that there was an active war underway, like the mortar rounds that sometimes exploded around the team's hotel. Despite the dangers, things went reasonably well with good cooperation from Russia and from the Syrian hosts. But the, then the tough slogging begins. Sigrid Kog, who's the Dutch diplomat in charge of the mission, describes the mission at one point as like being like trying to take a trip when there's no plane and no crew and no one who even knows how to fly. There are snags and delays and those optimistic deadlines start to slip. There's a moment in December 2013 when progress is stalled and everything looks pretty bleak. A snowstorm has closed the mountain passes to the west so supplies can't come in from Lebanon. The trucks that arrive for transport duty are found to be missing steering wheels and other key parts. Procurement officers struggle to find adequate numbers of storage tanks and cranes and forklifts. The rebel armies is, are suddenly on the, on the march in the north and the east, harassing in military convoys and advancing within striking distance of some of the weapons depots themselves. And there's also a never ending list of demands coming from the Syrian side, more armor, including armor plating for the vehicles, more heavy equipment and more time. And yet, one by one, the chemical storage depots are cleared out and the production equipment is dismantled and cut apart. As the final deadline approaches, there's drama again, this time because of fighting. Uh, an Islamist militia surrounds an airbase west of Damascus where the very last cache of weapons is held. There are long days of nervous haggling and cajoling until at the last minute, just days before an important deadline, a convoy of trucks roars out of the base and delivers the serum precursors to the port of Latakia where ships are waiting to take this, the, the supplies out to sea. Now, getting the weapons out of Syria was just one facet of the mission. Physically destroying them was another challenge. And at the outset, no one knew where the weapons would go or how they would be eliminated. A big part of the solution ends up coming from the United States. As part of the Pentagon's contingency planning, US officials looked around the Defense Department for technology that could be used to destroy Syria's weapons if they could be somehow acquired. And they specifically had to, to deal with sarin precursors that were in bulk liquid form. And in their quest, the Pentagon approached this man, an army chemical D-mill expert named Tim Blades. And he has an idea for a machine that could neutralize sarin precursor using hydrolysis. The machine didn't exist, so he built one. This is the FDHS, the Field Deployable Hydrolysis System, sometimes affectionately known as the Margarita machine. It went from design to prototype in six months. It was tested, it worked. And so Tim and his and team were ordered to build seven of them, basically on spec, on the possibility they might someday be useful. And then suddenly in the fall of 2013, there was an urgent need for a practical portable system for destroying serious chemicals. And this is the one that was ready to go. Now, the original plan was to put the machines on land somewhere hopefully not far from Syria, and let them operate quietly on a military base or a warehouse or air, airfield somewhere. But it soon became clear that there was no host country for this project. No country anywhere was willing to accept hundreds of tons of serious lethal chemicals. So with literally no other options, the Pentagon decides to, to try to do the job at sea. So Tim Blades' machines are bolted onto the deck of an old cargo ship, the Cape Ray, and he is put in charge of operating what will become the world's first floating chemical weapons destruction factory in the, metal, in the middle of the Mediterranean. Now, this was not an optimal solution. A ship at sea is constantly moving, so it's not a great place to have millions of gallons of highly to toxic liquid sloshing around. There are problems and a bit of heart-stopping drama, but in 42 days, the job is completed without serious mishap. 
As the crew was just departing for the Mediterranean, their official instructions were simple, don't spill a drop. And they met their goal. Somehow it held together and in 42 days, history was made and the last of the chemicals were neutralized. Waste products and a few other precursors were destroyed in incinerators with the help of Germany, Britain, and Finland. Now, finally, the OPCW's important work continued with the various fact-finding missions that we've heard about, and I won't go into detail with those, and I know that, that uh, DG and Zumchu will have much to say about that. But those new, new missions became necessary because chemical weapons continued to be used. Beginning in 2014, Syrians suffered multiple chlorine attacks, perhaps dozens. Years later, in a few instances, the attacks involved sarin, which was forensically linked to Syria's original stockpile, suggesting that some of Syria's weapons were not surrendered, but hidden away. The inescapable conclusion is that while the D-Mill project was highly successful, the deterrent effect was at best fleeting. The intent to use the weapons did not disappear. Accountability up until now has not happened, and the taboo against the use of chemical weapons has been eroded. Clearly, the OPCW and the international community has more work to do, but that does not negate or diminish, in my view, the success that was achieved in 2013 and 14. The bulk of Syria's stockpile, an estimated 90% of it, including the most lethal poisons ever created, is gone, along with the infrastructure that created it. Syria and the world are safer, undoubtedly, because it's gone. Thank you for your time, and I'll, I'll end my talk here. Thank you very much, Joby. That was really moving. And I must say, having uh, read the first half of your book, it really is like a, like a thriller. You know, it really draws you in. And as someone who was involved you know, in, the, in the chemical demil operation, have been for a long time, since the mid-1990s, I must say that the, uh, it's much more harrowing, you know, the whole operation. Maybe we can get into that. Uh, in Q and A, but uh, delighted to have you here, and and really happy that so many people we're up we're up to about two hundred um, participants right now could view it. So, with that, let me turn to our third speaker, uh, who is uh, former Director General Ahmed Uzumchu. Um, Ahmed Uzumchu uh, led the OPSW uh, from about two thousand ten to two thousand eighteen. Uh, in the uh, just before uh, the current director general uh, uh, Arias Fernando Arias took over, uh, and he was actually the uh, individual who really set up um, the declaration assessment team and the fact finding mission, and was there when these first when when Syria joined in 2013, and then uh, started you know dealing with uh, destruction of the of the 1,300-odd ton um, uh, chemical weapon stockpile of Syria. So he's also been uh, very supportive, uh, I think, of the uh, civil society and, and transparency and public involvement in the OPSW. So I thank him uh, at the beginning for that. Uh, he's uh, been a Turkish ambassador, and I first met him in Geneva when he was at the uh, Geneva mission uh, in Switzerland. So with that, let me turn it over to you, Ahmed, and we look forward to your remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for, for inviting me uh, today. Uh, I will try not to repeat what has been said by Director John Arias and Mr. Warwick, uh, but I want to start uh, with a few words about the Chemical Weapons Convention. As um, most people would know, the convention is uh, one of the peace dividends uh, from the end of the Cold War. Uh, like the negotiations uh, in Geneva were concluded in 1992, and the convention was opened to signature in January 1993 in Paris. This ratification process and entry into force was not that easy. It took some time to convince uh, the legislative bodies in certain countries uh, that the CWC would not undermine the security of their countries and the interests of their chemical industry. The CWC is now 25 years old and its implementation is a success story. With 193 states parties, it's nearly universal. The convention prohibits uh, the development, production and use of all chemical weapons. The general purpose criterion also prohibits the use of toxic chemicals such as chlorine to harm people or environment. The CWC is therefore comprehensive 
and all states parties are equal without any discrimination or privilege. The norm against the use of chemical weapons has never been challenged openly. On the contrary, the states parties solemnly declared on several occasions, including by the IPRA declaration in 2015, that they were committed to prevent any use of chemical weapons by anyone under any circumstances. This has been the main guidance given by the member states who are the real owners of the CWC regime. It's on these pre premises that the technical secretariat of the OPCW that I had the privilege to lead for eight years has operated all along. When the crisis erupted in March 2011 in Syria, we didn't know how it would unfold. We knew, however, that Syria possessed a large amount of chemical weapons, and these weapons could be used at a certain stage. We thought that the OPSW could be called upon to assume a certain role in Syria. We began to train our experts for a possible deployment in a conflict zone. They participated in the UN training programs and held exercises. They were also mentally prepared to a challenge, for a challenging mission. When the then UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon <clears throat> called me in March 2013 to request the support of the OPSW for the UNSG mechanism that he decided to invoke, I was able to reply that we were fully prepared to do it. The modalities of this mechanism were also in place since the lawyers of the UN and OPSW developed them over the previous two years. The UNSG mechanism was invoked to investigate an incident in Karal Sal, near Aleppo, reported by the Syrian government. 13 Syrian soldiers were killed as a result of chemical attacks by the armed opposition groups. The Western countries argued, however, that the attack was perpetrated by the government forces and the rocket fell short to kill its own soldiers. The UK and France asked the SG to investigate two other allegations of use in addition to the Canal Assault. The OPSW provided nine, the WHO, three experts for the mission. The UN asked Okensestrom from Sweden to lead it. The team was ready, but they couldn't deploy for months since the Syrian government insisted on the investigation of the one incident reported by them. Finally, they agreed to the arrival of the team in Damascus. While they were prepared to go to the sites of reports the incidents, the Sarin attack in Ghouta occurred on 21st August 2013. Ban Ki-moon instructed the team to go first to Ghouta. Anticipating a possible role for the OPSW in Syria, it pay off. We were able to find a sufficient number of experts who volunteered both for the UNSG mechanism in August 2013, as well as for the OPSW UN joint mission later on. The joint mission enjoyed the support of a large number of states parties. I had, uh, during the, its implementation, I had regular meetings with the American and Russian ambassadors to review the progress and address the outstanding issues. There was a consensus among the member states to make the mission successful. While the joint, joint mission was underway in March, 2014, we received new reports of use of chemical weapons in Syria. We thought that the OPSW couldn't remain indifferent since the credibility of the CWC regime was at stake. The mechanism foreseen by the CWC for such instances was the challenge inspection, which could only be invoked by a member state and none was willing to do so. We needed to invent something new. Following consultations with some member states, I proposed to the Syrian government to send a fact finding mission with a view to establishing the facts surrounding the allegations of use of chemical weapons. We developed a terms of reference, which was accepted by the Syrian authorities. Upon the request of the UN, we, were, we erected a virtual firewall between the joint mission and the FFM. Nevertheless, it took again some weeks to persuade the Syrians for the deployment of the FFM. In May 2014, we sent the team to Damascus. While they were preparing to go to the sites of reported incidents, a new attack occurred in Kafr Zita, near Hama. On 27th May, early in the morning, the OPSW team came under attack in the buffer zone between the government-controlled territory and the opposition-controlled one. 
a roadside bomb destroyed an armored vehicle, and this was followed by an ambush. Fortunately, the team members survived the attack with minor injuries. This was the longest stay for me. We had to call back our experts to The Hague. There were probably some expectations that we would abandon the mission. This would be a devastating failure for the organization. We decided to work from our side of Syria in neighboring countries. Our experts were adamant to unearth the truth in regard to the allegations of use of chemical weapons. Their mandate was limited though for, to determining whether chemical weapons were used and they would not get into attribution. The FFM's composition has changed from one mission to another, but they were all employees of the OPSW. During the investigations, they interviewed the victims, eyewitnesses, health personnel, collected biomedical samples from the victims and analyzed them. The FFM work was meticulous, science-based and professional conduct. When the OPSW began to operate in 1997, a laboratory was established in The Hague and a network of designated laboratories in member states was, was gradually developed. But this capacity was foreseen only for the analysis of environmental samples. Since the FFM couldn't go to incident sites, the collection of environmental samples was not possible. Whereas the FFM teams had the opportunity to collect biomedical samples from the victims who came across the borders. Hence, the OPSW established a new network of designated labs for the analysis of biomedical samples. The establishment of the FFM and the development of new capabilities, such as the network of labs to support its work, demonstrated the flexibility and the ability of the OPSW to adapt to new circumstances in order to meet new challenges. Any country which joins the CWC has the obligation to declare to the OPSW Secretariat the information on its chemical weapons program, the stocks, the delivery means, the production sites, the research centers, etc. An OPSW team helped the Syrian authorities to prepare its initial declaration. The team raised questions about some gaps and inconsistencies. The number of gaps and inconsistencies then increased following the visits of the declaration assessment team to labs, storage, and production sites. Traces of undeclared chemical weapons were found. Several questions remained unanswered. The Syrian authorities claimed that the program was compartmentalized and there was no single authority who could answer all those questions. Many experts who were involved in the program were no longer available. The Executive Council tasked me as Director General to meet with the Syrian Deputy Foreign Minister and his delegation on declaration-related issues. We met three times in The Hague. We made some progress. For instance, the research laboratories in Damascus were included in the declaration, but it was still far from being accurate and complete. The situation has not changed since then. Use of chemical weapons, such as sarin in Khan Sheikhoun and Latamina, increased suspicions that some stocks were hidden by the Syrian authorities. The use of chemical weapons is a crime. Those who are responsible must be held accountable. This is in fact the only way to deter further use. Therefore, an attribution mechanism within the CWC regime is indispensable. The OPSW UN Joint Investigative Mechanism, GIM, established by the UN Security Council in 2015, found the Syrian armed forces responsible of the use of chemical weapons in certain incidents. But its mandate was not extended at the end of 2017 because of the Russian opposition. A gap emerged. The OPCW Conference of States Parties was able to fill this gap in June 2018 by its de decision to set up the investigation and identification team under the authority of the Director General. The IIT has already produced some reports concluding again that the Syrian government was responsible. I, I hope that the IIT will be able to investigate all outstanding incidents. The CSP decision on Syria suspending its rights is important to show that the non-compliance by a member state will not remain unanswered. However, I hope that the individuals who have committed these crimes will one day be prosecuted and punished as well. Some states' parties claim that the CSP decisions politicized the OPCW, which should normally be a technical organization, 
and weakened the CWC regime. I don't agree with this observation. I believe that the CSP further strengthened the CWC regime. If some countries didn't take such a bold initiative, the credibility of the CWC would be seriously undermined. The member states of the OPSW should draw the necessary lessons from the Syrian experience. If another country which possesses chemical weapons wants to join the CWC, its transparency must be tested. A certain period of probation should elapse before the con that country is accepted as a full member. It's true that such a status is not foreseen by the convention, but this can be settled by a UN Security Council resolution. The CWC as an important pillar of the rules-based international order. Its credibility and integrity must be upheld by all states parties and other stakeholders, including the civil society. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Zumchu. That was really, really very helpful. And now we've heard from the current Director General, the former Director General, and a, uh, a really wonderful author and researcher from the Washington Post. And we will finish with uh, a presentation, a video from uh, the Under Secretary General and High Representative for Disarmament Affairs of the United Nations, Izumi Nakamitsu. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank the CWC Coalition for hosting today's webinar. I also want to take the opportunity to thank Director General Fernando Arias and Ambassador Ahmed Uzumchu for their years of dedicated service to the OPCW and for the support to the United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs. The norm against chemical weapons has been subjected to repeated and fundamental challenges. And the re-emergence of these weapons of terror is one of the most alarming developments in international security. Chemical weapons use in the Syrian Arab Republic, Malaysia, Iraq, the United Kingdom, and the Russian Federation have threatened the norms embedded in the Chemical Weapons Convention, or CWC, and profoundly damaged the disarmament and non-proliferation efforts. The United Nations Secretary General has repeatedly stressed that the use of chemical weapons anywhere by anyone and under any circumstances is unacceptable and has urged the international community to act. Yet the Security Council has not fulfilled its responsibility to hold accountable the perpetrators of these atrocious acts. It is alarming that more than one century after the end of World War I, and the adoption of the 1925 Geneva Protocol, and 25 years after the entry into force of the Chemical Weapons Convention in 1997, the use of chemical weapons continues to recur. Progress towards the elimination of chemical weapons requires a united and collective response and I am proud of the United Nations and the OPCW Technical Secretariat's strong and long-standing partnership working to achieve this goal. The close cooperation between the UN and the OPCW and the mutually reinforcing nature of their work was exemplified by the United Nations investigation into the allegation of the use of chemical weapons in the Syrian Arab Republic the so-called Southstrom investigation, the OPCW-UN joint mission, and the OPCW-UN joint investigative mechanism, or GIM. Further, these collaborations have provided the international community with lessons for international efforts to strengthen the norm against chemical weapons use. Let me briefly touch on each of these. On 21 March 2013, the Southstrom investigation was established by the United Nations Secretary General following requests by the Syrian Arab Republic and other UN member states to investigate separate allegations of the use of chemical weapons in the Syrian Arab Republic. This investigation 
was established under the mandate of the UN Secretary General's Mechanism, or UNSGM, for investigation of alleged use of chemical and biological weapons. This was due to the fact that, at the time, the Syrian Arab Republic was not state party to the CWC. The purpose of this specialized and impartial fact-finding mission, led by Professor Åke Selström of Sweden, was to determine whether or not chemical weapons had been used in the incidents reported. After an agreement was reached with the Syrian government in July 2013, the UN mission began its work in Syria on 19 August 2013. As the team was getting ready for their first investigation, reports about the Ghouta incident emerged, and the Secretary General included this incident in the mission. In the end, the team investigated seven of the 16 allegations reported to the Secretary General. The UN mission operated according to the guidelines and procedures for a UNSGM investigation, and it benefited from strong cooperation with the OPCW and the World Health Organization, WHO. The mission submitted its final report in December 2013, noting its conclusion that chemical weapons had been used during the conflict in Syria in five of the incidents reported to the Secretary General. In the end, the mission was a success. Not only did it achieve its mandate, but its work also played a crucial role in the accession by Syria to the CWC in September 2013. Following the accession of Syria to the CWC, the OPCW-UN joint mission was formally established in October 2013. The mandate of the joint mission was for an accelerated program to eliminate the Syrian Arab Republic's chemical weapons program by mid-2014, derived from OPCW Executive Council decision ECM33 slash decision 1 and Security Council Resolution 2018. The joint mission was headed by the Special Coordinator Ms. Sigrid Karg of the Netherlands. The OPCW-UN joint mission closed on 30 September 2014, although the OPCW continues to undertake the necessary residual activities required to fully implement Security Council Resolution 2118. In addition, in response to continued allegations of chemical weapons use in Syria, the OPCW fact-finding mission, or FFM, was established in 2014 to ascertain the facts surrounding allegations of the use of toxic chemicals for hostile purposes in the Syrian Arab Republic. The OPCW confirmed the complete destruction of all chemical weapons declared by the Syrian Arab Republic on 4th of January 2016. Pursuant paragraph 12 of Resolution 2118, the OPCW Director General has the obligation to report to the Security Council through the UN Secretary General on the activities related to the implementation of this resolution. Accordingly, my predecessors and I have briefed the Security Council members on a monthly basis since January 2015 on the elimination of Syria's chemical weapons program. Since February 2015, such monthly briefings included updates on the reports submitted by the OPCW FFM. Unfortunately, Despite the accession of Syria to the CWC and ongoing efforts to eliminate its CW program, there continue to be reports of use of chemical weapons in Syria, 
which were investigated by the OPCW FFM. As a result, in 2015, the Security Council adopted Resolution 2235, in which it established the OPCW UN Joint Investigative Mechanism, or JIM. The JIM's mandate was to identify, to the greatest extent feasible, those responsible for the use of chemicals as weapons in Syria. The JIM succeeded in implementing its mandate to conduct impartial, objective investigations. It assessed that, in three cases, the Syrian Arab Republic's armed forces were responsible for the release of chlorine. In one case, the Syrian government was responsible for the release of sarin. And in two cases, the Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant, ISIL, was responsible for the use of sulfur masters. In 2017, despite several proposals, the Security Council could not agree upon a further extension of the Jim's mandate. Consequently, the gym ceased functioning on 17 November 2017. The non-renewal of the mandate of the gym left a gap in the ability of international organizations to identify those responsible for the use of chemical weapons. Therefore, in June 2018, the fourth special session of the Conference of States Parties to the CWC granted the OPCW Secretariat the authority to conduct such investigations through the establishment of the Investigation and Identification Team, or IIT, as mentioned by Director General Arias. The IIT works to identify the perpetrators of chemical weapons use in Syria in those instances in which the FFM determines that use or likely use occurred and cases for which the GIM did not issue a report. The IIT's first report was released in April 2020 and it continues its important work to this day. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the use of chemical weapons is a grave violation of international law and an affront to our shared humanity. We need to remain vigilant to ensure that these awful weapons are eliminated, not only in Syria, but everywhere. Following the conclusion of the Salzman investigation, and the expiration of the Joint Investigating Mechanism, the Office for Disarmament Affairs conducted lessons learned exercises to identify recommendations that could benefit future such investigations and help to enhance common understanding of what can be done to establish effective and credible investigations into the alleged use of chemical weapons. Although the OPCW would take the lead on most future such investigations, the UN Secretary General's mechanism remains a tool for investigations related to states not party to the CWC. Further, given that there is no equivalent agency for the Biological Weapons Convention, the UNSGM is currently the only international mechanism for the investigation of alleged use of biological weapons, which will be a similarly grave violation of international law. Let me close by noting that the identification of those responsible for the use of chemical weapons is not the final objective. There is a step beyond that, wherein those who are responsible for the use of chemical weapons are then held accountable. I assure you that the United Nations remains committed to work with partners such as the OPCW and all its member states to restore the taboo against chemical weapons 
and to ensure that those responsible for their use, having violated such a profound international norm, are held to account. Let us all continue to support efforts to restore the strong norm against chemical weapons use, and in particular, the Chemical Weapons Convention and its essential work to build a safer, more secure world for all. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. And thank you, um, Izumi Nakamitsu, for joining in too. We've had a really, I think, a wonderful series of presentations, and I'm really uh, uh, impressed that, you know, 10 years after the first suspected use of chemical weapons uh, in Syria, uh, we've come a long way. And I think the OPSW and certainly um, former Director General Zimchu and current Director General Arias deserve an enormous amount of credit. Uh, and uh, and uh, Izumi Nakamitsu as well, who's really worked hard, I know, at the United Nations. Um, I'd like to uh, pose a first question to you both. Let's come from several individuals. Michael Moody is one, and, and uh, I think uh, Paul Schulte uh, was another who put in questions about uh, what sort of, this has been a very difficult period, obviously dealing with the illegal, illegal use of, of chemical weapons by Syria and by uh, ISIS, apparently. So I'm wondering if you could both comment on uh, what damage this has sort of done, if any, really, to the OPSW and the Chemical Weapons Convention. And are there further options, do you think, um, that might be taken by states parties uh, or individual, you know, or the whole OPSW to um, uh, hold Syria and, and non-state parties like ISIS accountable? Wanna, do you want to go first, uh, Ahmed? And you're muted, too. Yeah. Uh, all, all right, Paul. Um, um, actually, uh, one cannot deny that, uh, you know, the uses of chemical weapons in violation of uh, the Chemical Weapons Convention uh, did uh, damage the, the regime. So, uh, nevertheless, um, I, I, I think the OPSW uh, was able uh, to respond uh, to those allegations uh, and uh, by investigating them and uh, identifying uh, through different mechanisms uh, the, you know, who were responsible of such uses and so on. Uh, so if uh, no such steps were taken, uh, I think uh, the, the damage would be, would be enormous. Uh, but uh, I'm, I frankly uh, believe that, uh, you know, the regime is, uh, uh, the CWC regime is still uh, strong. And uh, obviously um, it would be, uh, stronger, um, uh, even stronger, if uh, those who are, uh, you know, uh, responsible of the users uh, could be held accountable. And um, for that, uh, obviously, uh, we we don't have the, such international mechanisms which are available. The international criminal court uh, could not be mandated, uh, you know, uh, only it could be only be mandated by the Security Council. Uh, which is uh, doesn't seem to be an option at present. Uh, therefore, uh, only uh, national tribunals uh, in certain countries uh, actually could be, uh, you know, seized uh, for uh, such uh, prosecutions and uh, punishments. And uh, I know that some steps have been taken in this in this regard. According to uh, criminal, uh, those who deal with criminal law. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, the only way to deter uh, certain crimes is uh, to convince them, uh, potential criminals, that they, they would be punished. So one day. Uh, therefore, in, um, as I said earlier, uh, the use of chemical weapons is also a crime. And those who used it, uh, you know, uh, or potential users would think twice if uh, they are, uh, they believe that they could be punished uh, one day. So that's uh, uh, actually what uh, I really hope 
uh, which uh, that will that will happen. But uh, again, by the decisions uh, uh, the op uh, which were taken over the past few years, uh, earlier by establishing the necessary mechanisms uh, within the OPSW, the organization has uh, proven uh, that it can adapt uh, to such circumstances. And I, I think it's uh, uh, it showed a great deal of. Um, uh, you know, adaptability. Uh, therefore, I, 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 I believe that uh, it's a strong regime. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed and Joby. Any comment? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with uh, DG Azumchu. Uh, it's, it's been kind of a mixed thing, to be honest. Uh, there's certainly been some erosion of the taboo because of there's been a lack of accountability. And I think various actors have seen that you can use chemical weapons. They're difficult to attribute in many cases. There's some deniability. So you can use them for, for various dirty tricks as we've seen several times over the last few years. And the, the, so the opportunity for real accountability is, is pretty limited in, in our world as, as we know it now, unfortunately, because there are ways to block uh, a true accountability processes, except perhaps through criminal courts, as we're seeing in Germany. But uh, what it is interesting, what does remain is that all these actors, none of them are willing to embrace the use of this weapon in a public way. We've seen even the Islamic State, and I've spent some time looking at what they did. They so were inspired, I think, by what they saw in Syria, and they ended up launching their own chemical weapons program. It didn't go very far, but they used crude chemical weapons, chlorine and mustard gas, in multiple instances. And while the, the Islamic State doesn't seem to, to shrink from you know, bragging about pretty much anything it does, it's never acknowledged the existence of this program. It's never acknowledged publicly using these weapons. And so that, that shame, I think, still exists. And being this, the shame of being called out and brought before world bodies such as the OPCW or as the UN Security Council, even if there's no ultimate, um, you know, penalty or punishment, you know, that is significant. And that's why I think the investigations that we see ongoing with the ITT and elsewhere, those remain important because they do name and shame and, and that has value in itself. Great, thank you. Thank you both. That, that We could go on, I'm sure, for another hour or something on that question, but um, we, have, we have several questions too, some anonymous um, from victims of chemical warfare and you know, I'd, I'd like to raise this issue in most of our discussions because we, we sometimes think about the politics and, of course, the military strategy and the legal international law or legal accountability of these issues. But we have thousands of victims, um, both killed and badly injured, from not only the Syria war, but also uh, past wars, the Iran-Iraq war, the Saddam Hussein attack, and, and other uses of chemical warfare over the, over the, the past century. And I'm wondering... Um, if you both could maybe respond to what more can be done for victims. Um, I know um, under your leadership, um, Ahmed, that um, I think a trust fund for victims was set up at the OPSW. And I know we have a monument behind uh, the OPSW, but what I hear from all the victims groups, which come from primarily around the rock uh, every year to the Conference of States Parties in The Hague is that they want medical support they want medicines, they want medical support, they want uh, to be cared for, um, in, particularly in both countries. And others also call for cleanup of old use of chemical weapons, what we'd call, I guess, old and abandoned or non-stockpile chemical weapons and the long-term damage that may be done in a number of countries uh, around the world, including, including most of Europe these days from World War I. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts uh, on victims' needs at all, to both of you. Why don't you go first, Ahmed? Sure. Um, as, as you said, at the uh, OPCW uh, headquarters, um, it is garden, there are two monuments, one uh, from Harapja. Uh, the, this monument was erected by Iraqis, and uh, the, the other one uh, from, from Iran. Uh, so uh, both of them actually uh, show the uh, are aimed at showing the, the plight, uh, the sufferings of the chemical weapons victims. I had, uh, I, I met several times, you know, um, victims both in Iran and uh, in Iraq, as, and also uh, they, they come, their representatives come every year uh, to 
uh, display, in fact, uh, to show uh, to the ISAT world uh, their, their sufferings during the annual conference of uh, states parties at the OPCW. So that, that's extremely important, in fact, that uh, uh, the victims who had uh, lived through, um, through it, actually through the sufferings, uh, do uh, raise awareness uh, among uh, the public in general, but also among those people who deal directly uh, with the implementation of the Chemical Weapons Convention. Uh, as you said, I mean, it, some, many victims actually can, are not able to, to live a normal life. Uh, you know, sulfur mustard uh, uh, in many instances did affect their, their lungs, their eyes, uh, their skin. And uh, so they, they need to go three or four times to a hospital for treatment uh, during a year. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, 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 and they die uh, at very early age. Uh, so uh, these, these are weapons, uh, uh, you know, uh, which may not kill uh, immediately uh, the victims, but uh, the victims do suffer throughout their, their, their lives. Um, I, I believe that uh, the, you know, the OPCW could do a little more. As you said, we uh, established this fund and uh, we established a victims assistance network uh, at the OPCW, but um, uh, more, more should be done. I mean, uh, because, uh, uh, you know, um, in, in, in nuclear weapons were, were used um, in, in Japan during sec at the end of the Second World War. And uh, the Japanese, uh, you know, victims, uh, I had the, the opportunity to go to, to Hiroshima. I, uh, you know, I listened uh, to these survivors. And um, I, I, I think, uh, and uh, I, I believe that that's good, uh, that they share their own experience. And the same uh, actually could be done for the chemical weapons victims. Uh, so raising awareness uh, uh, and uh, you know, prevention of uh, further use prevention of re-emergence of chemical weapons in the future, that, uh, I mean, all this will help, uh, in fact, to strengthen the determination of the international community to do it. Thank you. And Joby? Yeah, I, th I think that's right. I think there is a, a need and an obligation to promote uh, the stories of, of victims, because I, it just in my own experience in, in reporting on this book, you know, I was I, I kind of knew academically about the, the ones who were killed and the so the damage that chemical weapons can do. I didn't realize how many people survived and how many people were injured and still uh, carry the scars. And I remember an early conversation with uh, Director uh, General Zumchu about his own experience at meeting with these victims from Halabja in Iraq who had been carrying these scars for decades and still did. And that's not just to speak of the psychological terror, which is quite real. And one of the things we saw with, with Islamic State's use of chemical weapons in Iraq is, is the fear that engendered because people in those communities still remembered what happened. And to the extent that we tell those stories and we uphold those victims and, and their problems, I mean, that's, that's an important role for, for organizations like the OPCW as well, and for journalists, I think. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I give credit to the OPCW that they've put the, the issue of victims and victim support really at the forefront. I think you started all this uh, uh, Ahmed in your term, um, really at the forefront of every annual meeting. And I just, I just wish every year that we could do more medically uh, for uh, all the victims, particularly in Iran and Iraq, many of them still alive um, from the 1980s uh, and really suffering uh, mostly you know, breathing, breathing issues um, and all. And they just don't seem to get enough attention and enough medical support. Um, some, some of them blaming, I think, uh, Western sanctions uh, for refusing, uh, refusing uh, to import medicines. So um, I'd pose another question. One thing that really, and is raised in a couple of the questions online here um, about the inspectorate of the OPCW. The inspectorate has really been Extremely, and you, you tell such wonderful stories, Joby, going back to Ekaselstrom and, and Sigrid Tag and the joint, the UN OPCW, OPCW UN joint mission and all, and on the ground work. Uh, I've always um, commented in recent years that it's the first time UN inspector, uh, OPCW inspectors have ever had to get fitted for a, an armored vest, you know, 
I mean, previously it was counting numbers, you know, empty shells coming out of destruction machines and, uh, and the like are going into them. And now going into really uh, threatened areas, uh, it really is a high risk operation, certainly in Syria and potentially in other places, always has been to some extent because of the existence of deadly chemicals. But, and I'm wondering uh, what thoughts you'd both have on the importance of the inspectorate and from your side in particular, Ahmed, the, uh, the need for keeping a high level of experience and confidence in the inspectorate, even after we hopefully finish the destruction of uh, all declared chemical weapons stockpiles in, in 2023 uh, in the United States. I want you to start, Ahmed, again. Sure. Uh, I, I, I think the inspectorate is really uh, is the backbone of the uh, you know verification regime uh, of the Chemical Weapons Convention. So uh, when uh, you know uh, the crisis in Syria erupted, actually we were lucky to have a, quite a large number of uh, very experienced uh, inspectors because. Uh, the destruction activities uh, uh, were, were quite large at that time, and uh, uh, and the number of inspections was about uh, 200. Uh, so, and uh, when uh, you know we saw that uh, uh, a mission uh, in Syria uh, could, uh, for the OPSW could uh, could begin, uh, we were able to prepare them, as I said earlier. Uh, you know, both mentally and physically, uh, and uh, uh, not all, but some of them were ex-soldiers, uh, so who were, you know, used uh, somehow uh, to, to go to uh, conflict zones, but uh, not all of them, uh, and um, we had to train them. And uh, actually, uh, you know, when we uh, wanted to send about 20 inspectors to uh, Syria initially, there were already 60 uh, volunteers because you cannot really force, uh, you know, your staff to go to conflict zones. You, you, are, you are obliged to, to look for uh, uh, volunteers and uh, uh, there were more than uh, we needed. Um, and uh, they, they did a great job. Uh, they stayed actually uh, overnight, a um, few days in very remote areas. And uh, obviously we depended very much on the security provided by the Syrian armed forces. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they proved that uh, they were able to conduct a challenging mission uh, with uh, great uh, courage and uh, uh, dedication. So I, I, I think, uh, you know, when we talk about the success of the UN joint mission in, in Syria in 2013-14, uh, we all uh, this uh, actually success and credit uh, to, uh, to the inspectorate. And I believe for the future too, uh, the organization would need a strong, well, well-trained, uh, well-equipped uh, uh, you know, inspector corps uh, because uh, uh, the the organization could be called upon, you know, to challenging uh, missions in the in the future. So within the inspectorate, before I left, we uh, established a rapid response assistance mission because, uh, especially, uh, you know, there there are concerns among the membership that uh, the terrorist organizations, uh, non-state actors, uh, could uh, could use chemical weapons. And uh, such an assistance mission could be invited by any member state uh, to, to go and help, uh, you know, the, to, to manage the consequences of such, such uses in, in that country. So uh, th therefore, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure uh, that uh, regular training, uh, fresh training uh, programs are in place. Uh, and, uh, and the same inspectors, in fact, are used, uh, uh, you know, employed for uh, training of experts in member countries uh, for assistance and protection. Um, so within Article 10 of the uh, Convention, uh, the state parties, in fact, uh, uh, should uh, establish their own assistance and protection teams, uh, but uh, some of them are not technically capable of it. So. Uh, the OPSW sends uh, is, uh, inspectors as instructors for such training programs. 
Yeah. Thank, thank you, Ahmed. And Joby Ashaka, we're over time already, I know, so I don't want to keep people too long, but please. Start. Yeah, I know we're, we're late. So I'll just, just real quickly, I'll just say that one of the great privileges of writing this book was to get to meet some of those line inspectors, the ones that went out in the field. And you're right. I mean, they, these, these people did not sign up for a job, most of them, that, that it, it required this kind of bravery, to be frank. There was a kind of an accounting job and going to places and maybe helping with training and, and looking at stockpiles and, and, and just calculating. But here they ended up having to be thrust into a situation where it was physically dangerous and they didn't carry weapons. Not, not a single one of them carried arms. They were sort of armored jackets and helmets, but they went into places where many times it was physically extremely risky. And there are stories that I could not have included in my book. They were just just really harrowing situations they encountered. And yet again and again, they kept volunteering to go back because they believed in the mission. And it was sort of a band of brothers and sisters that got this job done. And so I really sort of commend the sort of professionalism of the people I met. And uh, it was it was an extraordinary privilege to get to talk to them. And I must say that they did anticipate and under a, uh, a DG Azumchu before this crisis or as it was just happening, a lot of training and a lot of preparation and go kits and sort of the kinds of things that would help them get logistically ready for a mission like this were ready to go. So when the sort of the legal approval came in September of 2013, these guys were ready to sort of jump off the plane and, and get the job done. So it was, it was quite remarkable. Well, thank you both. Um, I wish we had time for more questions. I, I apologize to those who've, whose questions have not been asked. We just have run out of time. Uh, but I urge everyone to keep up on this topic. Um, and I particularly want to uh, thank, I think, Daryl Kimball, the Executive Director of the Arms Control Association, Leanne Quinn, uh, on our program for the CWC Coalition, and uh, Tony, who's, who's been doing all the uh, unseen technical work in the background. So thank you all. Thank you for all, all the listeners, too. Uh, this is a topic which will continue. Uh, this year is the 25th um, anniversary of the of the CWC entry into force. Uh, as you heard, next year will be the fifth review conference in The Hague. Uh, and um, uh, we're really 10 years into use of chemical weapons in Syria at this point, and still trying to um, carry on and, and strengthen the CWC and the OPSWs. So with that, uh, I'll end, unless Leanne, you have any final remarks you'd like to make? No, nope, just wait. thank you, everyone. And I should note too, that this will be, this was transcribed or recorded, I should say, and will be on the uh, CWC Coalition website within a day or two, I think, probably by tomorrow. So thank you all very much, uh, particularly our four wonderful speakers, and, and uh, we'll be talking soon again. Bye-bye, everyone.